Last time in Fire Red, I beat the game with the regional rodent, the Raticate line. And so today, I want to continue with the Pokemon that I always viewed as related to Raticate, just because I played Pokemon Yellow as a kid, the Mankey line. The reason I always thought these two were related as a kid was because you could catch both of them in the early stages of Pokemon Yellow. Rattata is a normal type Pokemon, and Mankey contrasts that as a fighting type. Now, I really want to emphasize the fact that Mankey is quite frail. It has 40 HP, 35 defense, and 35 special defense. This is going to be relevant very soon. However, before that, let's go through its move pool. It starts with Scratch and Leer, then gets Low Kick at level 6, and Karate Chop at level 11. This move is now a fighting type move, unlike in Generation 1. Beyond that, its level up moves are not particularly good, with the exception of maybe Cross Chop. However, 80% accurate and 5 PP are just not particularly good for solo challenges. However, the Mankey line has a fantastic TM and HM learn set. It really gets a lot of great coverage moves. For example, Iron Tail, Thunderbolt, Rock Tomb, and Aerial Ace. It also gets Overheat and Sunny Day, which is kind of cool. And then through Move Tutors, it gets some more fantastic moves. Mega Punch, Mega Kick, and Rock Slide. Remember, Double Edge is not very good because I hate recoil damage and the Body Slam move tutor is inconveniently placed for solo challenges. Also, I should mention Substitute, which I have talked about previously in this series. With Primeape, we are continuing to make our way through backlogged footage. This one was recorded on June 23rd, so I still had no idea that I could get Substitute in Fuchsia City. So unfortunately today, we won't see this move in action. On the earliest routes of the game, I want to draw your attention to the move Low Kick, which Mankey has learned by now. This move deals damage based on the opponent's weight. This is new for the move, starting in Generation 3. Before that, it had a base power of 50, with an accuracy of 90 and a 30% chance to cause a flinch. So I'm going to bring up this chart, which is Low Kick's power based on the weight of the opposing Pokemon. Now, weight is something that is sort of hard to get a sense for, because there is no way for you to see this other than consulting the Pokedex. And I don't know about you, but I have not gone through the Pokedex and memorized every Pokemon's weight, so I figured it would be convenient for all of us to have Low Kick's base power dynamically calculated by my overlay. So during battle, it will use the opponent's weight to calculate Low Kick's base power, and then it will adjust it based on the type effect modifiers as well as same type attack bonus, etc. One small note I want to make here is that when it was changed in Generation 3, this move lost its ability to flinch the target. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time talking about Low Kick, and that is largely because I think it is going to be my way to get by Brock. And in Generation 1, this was Mankey's best move in the early game. However, in Generation 3, it is definitely Scratch, because there are a lot of bugs in the forest which are really annoying to knock out with fighting type moves. And remember when I said that Mankey is frail? Yeah, it gets poisoned by bug catcher Doug. He has two Weedle and one Kakuna, and I am not able to finish him off before the poison damage knocks Mankey out. So that is a very early reset for this playthrough. Instead of wasting my time grinding in the forest or losing to bug catchers again, I decide to train in this grass patch where I can fight normal type Pokemon, which are a lot easier for Mankey to knock out. Although I have to be a little bit careful against Pidgeys and their flying type move Gust. Once I reach level 9, I head back into the forest, defeat bug catcher Doug, securing my revenge, then I crush the mandatory bug catcher and head into Pewter City. Here, I can face Camper Liam in Brock's gym. He has a Geodude, and this is the first time we get to see Low Kick with a pretty good effective power. However, by this point, Mankey has learned Karate Chop, and after the same type attack bonus, as well as the super effective modifier, this move is just going to be doing more damage. Obviously, Liam is very easy to finish off, but I didn't quite feel prepared for Brock yet. At level 12, I am just under a damage rounding threshold, and these matter a lot more at lower levels. Yes, by the way, damage rounding is still a thing even in modern Pokemon games. It has never been changed. So I train in the wild, leveling up to 13, and with that, I am ready for my first gym battle. Brock leads with Geodude. Now, Karate Chop is a high critical hit ratio move, so it scores a crit, knocking his lead out in a single turn. Alright, so I'm moving on to his ace, Onyx, and this thing is very heavy. 
It gives low kick an effective power of 360. However, Onyx has really good defenses, so it still survives the super effective hit. However, it just goes for a not very effective Rock Tomb, which does almost nothing. This does lower my speed, Onyx gets a tackle in, but it has 35 base attack. So yeah, I finish it off with ease and earn myself the Boulder Badge. With it comes a 10% boost to my attack stat, which is perfect for Mankey. This is one advantage that physical attackers have in these games. They always get their badge boost much sooner than the special attackers. Special attackers actually have to wait all the way until I defeat Blaine. However, the game punishes physical attackers in other ways, and we're going to talk about that later in this playthrough. For now, let's head out onto Route 3. Here there are a decent number of bugs and poison types, which are still very annoying for Mankey to knock out. He's his best normal type move is Scratch. However, all of that is going to change soon enough. I make my way through Mount Moon, fighting a few additional trainers along the way just for some extra experience. Of course, I pick up the Dome Fossil, and then I head outside of the cave, where there are two move tutors waiting for me. These guys teach the moves Mega Punch and Mega Kick, and for Mankey, I'm going to teach it both of these. Of course, I don't think I'm going to use Mega Kick that much, because it does only have 75% accuracy. Here I should note that the accuracies have all been glitched on my overlay. I caught this just before the rival fight, so it will be corrected from here on out in the video. One more thing I want to note about the move tutors in Generation 3 is that all of them replace TMs that were available in Generation 1. This is actually very convenient for me for my backport series because it can check a Pokemon's Generation 3 learn set and determine which TMs it would have learnt in Generation 1 just by looking at the move tutors. So thank you Game Freak for thinking of me all of those years ago. Now I'm heading into Cerulean City and Misty is obviously much better in these games than she is in Generation 1, so the right battle for me to do now is the rival on Nugget Bridge. However, this could be a little bit tricky for Mankey because his lead is a Pidgeotto and it knows Sand Attack. However, Pidgeotto is a pudgy bird because Low Kick actually has decent power against it. Unfortunately for me though, it still takes two turns to knock out, so I have my accuracy lowered once by Sand Attack. But that was probably the hardest Pokemon on the rival's team. His Abra that's next only knows Teleport, so it can't do any damage to you unless it depletes all of its PP and starts using Struggle, but like, I don't think that that's ever going to happen. After that, I finish off the Rattata in two hits and move on to his ace, Charmander. Here I go for Karate Chop just in case I get a critical hit, and I luck out, finishing his last Pokemon off in a single hit. The next section of the game brings some moveset upgrades to Mankey. First of all, I can teach it Focus Energy. In this case, I decide to teach it over Low Kick, just because weight-based damage is very contextual, and there aren't a lot of heavy Pokemon that are significant in the future. Like, Giovanni has some Rhyhorns, but they're pretty bad in this game. Outside of that, I guess Giovanni has an Onix, and Bruno has two Onix, but they're Onix, so yeah, no more Low Kick. Also, I haven't used it yet, but I am keeping Mega Kick just in case I need it for massive damage against Misty. Also, at the end of Route 25, I am able to pick up the TM for Secret Power. It has 10 less base power than Mega Punch, but it does have 100% accuracy, and on normal terrain, it has a 30% chance to cause paralysis. This move is essentially the Generation 3 Body Slam, and most Pokemon end up using it. So just before Misty, I teach it in the place of Mega Punch. To fully prepare for the battle, I give Mankey a person Berry, and now I'm ready to take on Misty. She leads with Staryu, which is conveniently not a Psychic type, and here I want to get set up with Focus Energy. This move actually works in Generation 1, so that's nice. However, Mega Kick refuses to work because it misses twice against the Staryu before I finally hit and knock it out. Because of my luckless Mega Kicks, I'm essentially relying on a critical hit against the Starmie, which I don't get, so it finishes Mankey off, giving it its second reset of the run. The most consistent approach is going to be coming back to this fight with a Primeape. Therefore, I head to the SSN so that I can do the mandatory battles here to level up. Also, this area provides me the very useful TM for Brick Break. While Karate Chop does more damage when it gets critical hits, Brick Break is just going to be overall much more consistent. And if you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know that I love consistency, so obviously I'm going to teach this to Mankey right away. 
Now, let's take on the rival on the SSN. His lead is always one of the Pidgey line, which is really frustrating. Also, it survives on a sliver of health in this battle, and then lowers my accuracy with Sand Attack. It also puts in work with Gust, taking me down to orange health before I knock it out. Then, because the AI is decently smart in Generation 3, he sends in Cadaver next, I miss, and it finishes me off with Confusion. That's reset number three. Instead of fighting the rival again, I decided to prepare more by fighting optional trainers and evolving into a primate. This evolution increases Mankey's base stats across the board by 25 points. So Primeape ends up with 65 HP, 105 attack, 60 defense and special attack, 70 special defense, and 95 speed. Honestly, it's a decent Pokemon for a playthrough that I have surprisingly never used myself in a casual run. Going back to the rival, I can now one-hit the Pidgeotto, as well as the following Kadabra, and the Raticate. That Brick Break was definitely the one that broke the Raticate's back. His ace has evolved to a Charmeleon, but once again, Brick Break gets the one-hit, so that's a clean sweep for Primate. So now let's return to Cerulean City and see if I can defeat Misty. Previously I didn't outspeed the Starmie, so evolution has given me that advantage. Obviously I one hit the Staryu, move on to the Starmie. I go for secret power here just in case I get paralysis, which I do, and then I finish it on the second turn. This post-evolution Misty fight was incredibly simple. Now in retrospect, teaching Mega Kick earlier on in the run was just a waste of time, because at this time I'm going to delete it so that I can access Dig. This is going to give Primeape super effective damage against the next gym leader who is Surge. Okay, so how is he going to do today? First is Voltorb. I just go for Brick Break against it because I want to knock it out in one turn and not waste time with Dig. After that, he sends in Pikachu, which I also Brick Break, just so that it doesn't set up Double Team. However, because this move makes contact, it does activate Static Paralyzing Primate. But I've prepared for this with a Cherry Berry, so I heal the status condition and move on to the Raichu. Now, I know I taught Dig specifically for this fight, but what if I just use Brick Break on the Raichu? And yeah, Primeape gets the one hit, so Dig was not required. Surge is just that bad. His badge gives Primeape a 10% boost to its speed stat. If you know my Pokemon Yellow series, you might have thought that I misspoke there, because Surge's badge boosts your defense in Generation 1, but in Generation 3, this error was corrected, so now it boosts your speed stat, as was always intended. If you need proof, check out Surge's post-battle Generation 1 dialogue. In the remakes, the next section of the game is largely uneventful. In Rock Tunnel, there is a move tutor who is very hidden away if you don't have Flash. He's just south of Dudley, the self-destructing hiker, so today I'm going to talk to him and teach Primate Rock Slide. While it only has 90% accuracy, it pairs really well with moves like Dig and Brick Break to give Primeape a little bit more coverage, especially against Flying-type Pokémon. After that, I head into the Rocket Hideout because this area is mandatory in Fire Red. Here I teach Primeape Cross Chop in the place of Focus Energy, but I'm not actually going to use this move once in the playthrough, I am just going to delete it for return in a little bit. However, I figured I should mention it just in case someone brought it up, like why didn't you use Cross Chop? It has 80% accuracy, and if it isn't 100% accurate, it is based basically dynamic punch. A move that very thankfully is no longer a TM. Thank you Game Freak for adding Brick Break to the game in Generation 3. Like why in Generation 2 are the only fighting type TMs absolutely useless? You have Dynamic Punch in case you want to miss, and then you have Rock Smash in case you want base 20 power. Yeah, a Pokemon like Tyrogue, its only same type attack bonus move is Rock Smash. That gets me so frustrated. Anyways, back to the Primeape playthrough. Of course, Giovanni's easy, and then I head to Pokemon Tower to take on the rival there. Alright, Pidgeotto's the lead, will I continue to one-hit it? This time I have Rock Slide for super effective damage, and it goes down. I really hope that that is going to be a trend that continues throughout this playthrough, because getting hit by Feather Dance is brutal. Next is Execute, Return takes it to Red, it does basically nothing with Confusion, and I finish it on the next turn. I outspeed the following Kadabra. Actually, Primeape has almost double its speed by this point, because Primeape is fast, I have badge boosts on my side, and as we found out in the previous video, the man 
mandatory battles in Fire Red give you a lot of speed EVs. I think this is very interesting because it provides a major contrast to a game like Pokemon Yellow, where speed is incredibly important in the mid game. That's largely due to the fact that the gym leaders received a major level boost from Red and Blue, which is not present in Fire Red, and also you need Koga's badge to boost your speed. And after all, it can be difficult to obtain because he does have the psychic flying type Venomoth. The rest of the rival battle wasn't notable, so let's move on. On Cycling Road, I skip all of the optional battles, figuring that Primeape is doing pretty well right now. Let's just continue and see how far the momentum goes. After the Safari Zone's complete, I head into Erika's gym to take on the fourth gym leader. Up first is Victory Bell, I go for Return, it takes it to Orange, and then Victory Bell paralyzes me. Erica uses a Hyper Potion, but it doesn't prevent two more returns from hitting, and with that, her lead goes down. Next is Tangela. This thing is really bad. Like, I guess it has Giga Drain, but other than that, it's kind of useless. After that, Vileplume comes out. Now, its most intimidating move is Sleep Powder. However, Primip has Vital Spirit, so it couldn't get put to sleep anyways. By the way, this does mean that Primip cannot use the move Rest for recovery, despite being able to learn it through TM, which I find really weird. It seems clear that Game Freak prioritizes very young players in their games, but then why did they give this thing Rest as a possible move? Game Freak, are you trying to bait 10 year olds into using their Rest TM on a Primape, then to only have them find out that this move doesn't actually do anything? Anyways, it's just it's a strange design choice. Obviously Erica was easy, so let's move on now. At this point in the playthrough, I have to decide where I'm going to go next. Do I face the rival in Sylph, or do I take on Koga? Overall, the rival is generally much harder to defeat, just because his team has good type diversity. Whereas Koga has his awful mono poison team from Red and Blue. So I figured facing him first would be the safe bet. Up first is Coughing. Now this thing has Levitate, so I have to use Return to knock it out, and it takes two hits. Next, Koga sends in Muck. Unfortunately, Return does just under half to it. It poisons me with Toxic, but the Pecha Berry counters that, and I take Muck to low health with Return. Now that was definitely a mistake. The consequence is that Koga is going to use a healing item on the next turn, and before that, his Muck Sludge poisons Primeape. Because I've already burnt through my berry, I cannot heal the status condition, and the Muck does get one more attack in, which in combination with poison damage finishes Primeape off. That's my fourth reset, and it was against Koga of all people. I did not expect that. Now I'm sure some of you are going to comment, why didn't you use Dig against the Muck, because it does do more damage. Well, Muck knows Minimize and Acid Armor, and I didn't want those moves to get out of control, so I decided to go for straight damage instead. Now instead of grinding against Koga and trying to win, I decided to go to Sylph. However, while I do that, let me talk about Koga just a little bit more. In Generation 3, the introduction of Levitate was huge for poison types. It took away the Gengar line and Weezing line's weaknesses to ground type moves. That's very significant for solo playthroughs because in Generation 1, Dig is primarily used as the counter to those Pokemon. Now I said earlier that this game loves to punish physical attackers, and Levitate is one way that it does this. After all, for a Pokemon like Primeape, when it has a ground type move, it has to rely on Return to defeat Koga, and then it's going to have to rely on Rock Slide to defeat Agatha. However, this isn't where the punishment of physical types ends. Because against the rival in Sylph, he now has a Pidgeot. I miss my Rock Slide which is very bad because Pidgeot goes for Feather Dance, lowering my attack stat by two stages. Here's the thing though, Pidgeot has decent bulk, and it would have survived a Rock Slide anyways, because my next one does less than half. The rival sends in Execute next, and yeah, Execute finishes Primeape off, which is not a good sign for this section of the game. Instead of fighting him again, I think that I need to do some grinding. I'll start this all off by fighting the Hypno Sandwich Trainer, and then I'll continue with other trainers in Sylph. I take Primeape up from level 43 to level 45 in hopes that this damage rounding threshold is going to give me the one hit on the Pidgeot with Rock Slide. And in this case, it doesn't even get close. I would probably need level 48 to get some damage ranges that would give me the knockout, and maybe level 50 to guarantee it. So once again, I do get to the Execute, and it uses Stun Spore on Primeape, so I just decided to reset here and not waste any additional time. For me, it is sadly time to head back to grinding. 
At level 48, I try the fight again, miss Rock Slide and get hit by Feather Dance, so that is a reset. When Rock Slide hits, the Pidgeot survives with a sliver, as I anticipated, and that gives it the time it needs to use Feather Dance once before going down. I tried to play this fight out, but once again Execute paralyzes Primeape, and by the time it goes down I only have orange health left over. Alakazam is next. This thing does only have Future Sight as a damage dealing move, so I am able to finish it off. Oh, how this mighty Pokemon has fallen from its red and blue days. However, Charizard has got a lot of improvements. It doesn't just have Ember anymore, it now has Flamethrower, as well as Wing Attack, so it finishes Primeape off. Maybe instead of fighting the rival in Sylph, I should go back to Koga and see if this battle is possible. I forgot my Petcha Berry, I get my Accuracy Lord by Smoke Screen, then Primeape gets poisoned, and eventually it goes down to the Weezing. However, that's a little bit encouraging. I did get further in the fight than I ever have before. Now, earlier in the playthrough, I talked about momentum and skipping all the trainers on Cycling Road. Yeah, that was obviously a mistake. I should have just fought everyone there. If I had, I would have been a higher level and likely been able to prevent a lot of resets as well as time bleed from backtracking and wandering back and forth between Sylph and Koga's gym. And that time spent wandering back and forth cannot be underestimated because when you're playing on four times speed, if you say spend 50 15 seconds wandering, that is a minute of game time that has accumulated. That's one of the main reasons I love tracking all four metrics, because there always feels like there's some sort of pressure. If I reset, I get punished because the reset counter and the real time increments. If I backtrack, then I get punished with both real time as well as game time. And if I spend time leveling to lower the reset counter, then I am punished with both real time and game time. It is really fun trying to balance all of these metrics. Remember though, I always do prioritize real time over everything else. I think it's the most accurate metric and it is the most intuitive. When you look at it, you know how long I sat in front of my computer playing the game. Okay, so I've done some training, I'm now level 50. I wanted to see if I could one hit the rival's Pidgeot, and at this level, the answer is now yes. I move on to the Execute, it misses Stun Spore and I take it out, so my Primeape has no status condition and it's at full health by the time the Alakazam comes out. Things continue to be good because I get a critical hit, knocking it out in a single turn, and then the rival sends in Charizard. Okay, but I outspeed and I have four times damage with Rock Slide, so I finish it off. And now I'm going to bring us back to that idea about the game punishing physical attackers. Because his last Pokemon is Gyarados, and its ability is Intimidate, which lowers Primeape's attack stat. While that isn't relevant in this battle, the sheer number of enemy Pokemon that have Intimidate throughout the playthrough really does hamper a lot of physical types and their potential in these games. As I said before though, Substitute's a good counter, but I didn't know about it when I was playing this run. So with Giovanni and all of Sylph cleaned up, I wanted to finish off everything in Saffron City, so I went to Sabrina's gym next. Honestly, in red, blue, fire red, and leaf green, she is kind of trash. Since she has four Pokemon on her team, they're all lower levels, which means they have lowish speed stats. Primeape is significantly faster than even the Alakazam. Plus, they all have frail physical defenses, which allows me to just one hit all of them with return. Yes, even the incredibly powerful psychic flying type Venomoth. Now, a little bit of embarrassing footage here. I did try to surf to Cinnabar Island after defeating Sabrina. But no, that does not work because I don't have Koga's badge yet. So will it be possible for Primeape at level 52? And yeah, the answer is no. I lose again, this time to the Muck. I did not even make it to the Weezing. I figured that that was just bad luck. I tried again, but once again Primeape loses. I am forgetting the Pecha Berry, which would really help here. I did some additional training to take Primeape up to level 53, and then I came back to Koga, remembered the Pecha Berry, and finally, at long last, I am able to defeat him. With the Soul Badge, my Primeape now gets a 10% boost to its defense stat, and I have access to Surf outside of battle. This opens the way for me to face Blaine. His team is one of the worst Intimidate offenders. He has both Growlithe and Arcanine. Luckily for me, Rock Slide 1 hits the Growlithe as well as the Ponyta, so I get to the Rapidash without taking any damage. Rock Slide takes it to red health, it does chip damage, Blaine heals it with a potion, and then I finish it off with two uses of return. I did that just for accuracy. He sends in his ace, Arcanine, intimidating me again, and that takes Arcanine out of two hit range. Just barely, by the way. 
It hits Fire Blast, taking Primeape under half health. My next Rock Slide takes it to red health. Arcanine takes Primeape down to four hit points. And once again, it looks like this fighting type is going to have another difficult gym battle. Blaine heals Arcanine to full health with a Hyper Potion, which is going to give it the turn it needs to knock me out. However, at the perfect moment, Rock Slide gets a flinch. And so I am able to hit with one more attack and finish Blaine off. I can't believe Primeape made it through there. That opens the way to the final gym. By the way, I just want to mention that the trainers in here have much better teams than they do in the original games. Like, this guy has a team of five, and they're honestly pretty good Pokemon with good moves. I'm sure that this trainer is not going to be a problem in any future runs. Well, for Prime AP he certainly isn't, so with that, I have made it to Giovanni. This team is another way that the game punishes physical attackers. He has two Rock-type Pokémon and two Poison-type Pokémon. As a physical attacker, the go-to typing to take those down would be Ground. However, for a physical attacker like Primeape that only has access to Dig, I am not going to be able to use it against these Pokémon. And that is because of how Earthquake works. If you go underground, it will deal double damage. So for this fight, I have to rely on Return and Brick Break. And you would think that the physical punishment ends there, however it doesn't, because the Nidos both have Poison Point, so whenever you make contact with them, they have a chance to poison you. And that happens for me here against the Nido Queen. but this is just insult to injury, the Nido King was going to finish me off anyway. So what's my answer for this fight? Um, it's pretty underwhelming. I just don't get poisoned by the Nido Queen on the first turn. Because of that, I'm able to finish it off. I do get poisoned here. However, the poison damage and the damage Nido King deals is not enough. So then when I make it to the Rhyhorn, I can one hit with Brick Break and just barely survive on red health. I have made fun of this Giovanni team a lot, but I guess in some circumstances it is actually kind of scary. I think I could have been stuck there a lot longer. Okay, so it's time for Rival 6. Hopefully Rock Slide is going to one-hit the Pidgeot, and the answer is, of course, no it's not. The Pidgeot survives, but luckily it does not go for Feather Dance. So I finish it off, move on to the Alakazam, which I one-hit with Return, because Primeape is really fast. I love playing with speedy Pokémon. Next, the rival chooses to send in Charizard because it has Wing Attack. However, Rock Slide does four times damage, and I finish it off. Rhyhorn is honestly just a bad Pokémon on this team. Like, it does no Rock Blast, making it a bit better than its red and blue counterpart, but still, it's really not good. I take it out with a single Brick Break, move on to the Execute, which is annoying because I don't really have a good move against it. It's decently bulky, so it survives a hit and paralyzes Primeape. However, I finish finish it off, momentum is on my side. Even with Gyarados's Intimidate, it just isn't enough for the rival. So with that, Primeape is moving on to the Elite Four. As you watch the first fight against Lorelei, note my damage ranges against all of her Ice-type Pokémon. In this case, Primeape has a type advantage, but it's just not able to put out the damage that it needs to. In solo challenges, a common solution for this kind of problem is to use a setup move. However, unfortunately for Primeape, I did not realize that it can learn Bulk Up. Plus, I had no idea where this TM is because it's not given to you conveniently like it is in the Hoenn games. If you didn't know, you can acquire it in Sylph, so I really should have done that, and and it would have made so many parts of the game much easier. Imagine Koga, Blaine, and Giovanni if I could use Bulk Up. For Koga, I could easily set up on either one of his first two Pokémon. For Blaine, I could set up on his Growlithe. And for Giovanni, I could set up on his Rhyhorn. This kind of major mistake is something that happens when you're new to a game. It probably shouldn't have happened. I really should have reviewed the move set and gone, what is the most important move? Probably the setup move that boosts both your primary offensive stat and one of your defensive stats. However, this is the situation that this playthrough is in, and as I've said before on the channel, I am going to report what happens, not the ideal scenarios. So in this case, there is going to be no second playthrough. Of course, there is only going to be a first playthrough. So how is Primeape going to do when it's hamstrung by the player because I forgot Bulk Up? Well, the answer is not particularly good because I have one reset against Lorelei. However, in the next fight, things go much better. I one hit the Dugong, next is Slowbro, and it does try to use Yawn against me, which obviously is foiled by Vital Spirit. It does about a quarter with Surf, Lorelei heals it with a full restore, and then I knock it out with three consecutive uses of Return. This gives it time to hit one more Surf before it goes down, so I have just under half health left when the Cloister comes out. However, it has a terrible move set, it just goes for Spikes, and that lets me finish it off with two uses of Brick Break. I outspeed Jinx, 
Prince getting the one hit. Lapras doesn't deal enough damage to Primeape, and so with that I'm able to finish the first League member off. Bruno is next, and he's honestly quite good in these games. However, when you lead with Onyx, you expose yourself to setup strategies, and bulk up would have been perfect here. In this case, without it, I do have one reset to the Machamp. However, this inspires me to teach Primeape Earthquake in the place of Dig, which is long overdue. Honestly, just imagine the set bulk up, brick break, rock slide, and earthquake. Like, Primeape would be very unstoppable with that. Either way, Earthquake really helps out and I get back to the Machamp in the next battle. In this case, Brick Break is doing the most damage, I take the Machamp down to just over half health with it, and then I use the less powerful Return so that the Machamp eats its Citrus Berry instead of Bruno using a full Restore. By doing this, I am just barely able to survive the Machamp's next Cross Chop and finish it off with my next Return. Okay, so the fighting type has made it to Agatha. Now in Generation 1, she is basically a wall for most fighting type Pokemon. Also for some non-fighting type Pokemon like Krabby, the fight against Agatha in that run was absolutely brutal. However, here in Generation 3, she's actually worse in a lot of ways. Like for example, her final Gengar does not have Psychic or Dream Eater, instead it has Physical Moves, Shadow Ball, and Sludge Bomb, which I guess are both the same type attack bonus, but they're not going to hit very hard when Gengar has much less attack than it has special attack. Consequently, even despite Levitate and Rock Slide's accuracy, Primeape is able to take a first attempt victory against her. So with that, I am moving on to Lance, who is a flying-type specialist. Yeah, he has two Dragonairs in this game, but like, the majority of his Pokémon are flying-types, and that's quite bad for Primeape. However, notably the Gyarados does not have any flying-type moves, which really makes sense with the design of Gyarados. Like, where are its wings? Are those its wings? Those are definitely not its wings. Anyways, this is just another reason to kick myself for not taking Bulk up into this fight. I could have set up once or twice against the Gyarados, and then Rock Slide would one-hit the Aerodactyl. But in this case, it doesn't, so I get brought to orange health before the Dragonite, and it takes only a third, so Wing Attack finishes me. I try this fight again, but yeah, this is not gonna work. The Aerodactyl just polishes Primeape off again, and with that loss, I blacked out, figuring that Primeape just needed more levels. I trained from level 65 up to 71 before I attempted the League again. Note that I had another small mistake here. I forgot to buy additional full restores for the League. I'm used to resetting and replenishing the quantity that I have in this way. Because of this, I decided to reset before Bruno and just do Lorelei again. In this League attempt, I do have one reset to Agatha, which is a little bit frustrating. But finally, I make it back to Lance, and I am significantly higher leveled now. Primeape is level 79. However, the fact that I left the League and came back later gave me the ability to up upgrade Primeape's moveset. Primeape is going to be using Thunderbolt. This has two advantages. Number one, it's four times damage on the Gyarados, and number two, it uses my special attack, which is actually higher after Gyarados' Intimidate. Also, despite what I thought when I was a kid, the Rock type is not immune to electric type attacks, so Thunderbolt is super effective on the Aerodactyl. However, it just barely doesn't have enough damage to finish it in one turn. As a result, it takes some damage before it goes down, then Dragonite comes out, and it has enough damage to finish Primeape off. So what did it take to get by Lance? I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it took a Hyper Beam miss from Dragonite so that I could get three Rock Slides in to finish it off. From there, Prime of Two hits the two Dragonairs, and finally this fight is over. Now in prep for the champion fight, I am once again going to teach Primeape Brick Break, this time in the place of Return. By the way, if you ever want to relearn Brick Break, you can just buy the TM from the department store. That is something I've learned more recently, and it's really great that you have an option to replenish this move later on in the playthrough. It just adds a lot of flexibility. Okay, with that, I am ready to take on the champion. Can Primeape clock in under two hours? Let's find out. Pidgeot is up first. I go for Rock Slide, and it gets the one hit. Okay, I don't have to worry about Feather Dance. Next against Alakazam, I go for Earthquake, one-shotting it easily, so the champion has no potential to use Psychic against me. He chooses Charizard next, which Rock Slide easily dispatches. However, things are going to slow down from here because next is Executor. This thing is usually really annoying with Sleep Powder. I don't know why today it chooses to go for Giga Drain, then it flinches, uses Egg Bomb, and I take it down. Next is Rhydon, and it gets a scary face off. However, Brick Break is doing so much damage, the champion tries to heal it with a potion, but my next Brick Break rolls better damage, and I finish it in a single hit. All that's left is Gyarados, of course I have Thunderbolt for it. So. Primeape defeats the champion on its first attempt. 
It clocks in with a time of 1 hour 55 minutes and 9 seconds, with 20 resets at level 80. This took 6 hours and 44 minutes of game time. So how do these results stack up against all of the other Pokemon that I have done so far? Well, even though I made major mistakes in this run, I still think that Primeape did pretty well. It's significantly slower than all the starters, and I think even with Bulk Up, it still would be slower than all of them. However, it's much faster than Butterfree. It is worth noting though that that was my very first Fire Red video, so I was playing terribly with the early game bug type. I think with a second attempt, both Primeape and Butterfree would improve significantly, but overall, I anticipate that the rankings will stay the same. Now if we compare Primeape with the early game Pokemon, like Raichu, Raticate, and Pidgeot, this thing was so much better. Raichu really lacks the type coverage that it needs to excel in basically any game. This is sort of the curse of electric types. They're usually only given electric and normal type moves, leaving them very susceptible to rock ground types. Using an electric type kind of feels like using a siege tank against mass immortals. If you played any StarCraft 2, you will definitely know what I mean. Raticate was largely held back by its stats and the Pidgeot on the rival's team. If it can't one hit, then it can't get around Feather Dance consistently. And speaking of Pidgeot, that line is just a mess. It really doesn't have anything going for it. Like in Generation 1, it was honestly better because it had agility and you could use that to badge boost. But in Generation 3, it's just a fast flying type with agility. I guess that's good if you get hit by scary face. Anyways, after the suffering from the last few videos and the major mistake in this one, I think it is time to play the game with a Pokemon that will crush. So in the next Fire Red video, I will be playing the game with Nidoking, the original speed running Pokemon itself. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, it means the world to me. Thank you so much. And now, if you've made it this far in the video, you're incredible. I'll see you in the next one.